go beyond our traditional professional disciplines. We recognize the need to, to, to co-develop integrated solutions. Uh, very often with our clients and also uh, even more so with a lot of our strategic partners. Okay, so in early 2019, uh, I, I, I moved within CPG, moved to the corporation level as a group chief innovation officer. So this is fairly new. Uh, so so I'm, some of my friends may not know this. And then one of my uh, responsibilities involve uh, uh, working both within CPG to develop our capabilities to uh, better integrate the different uh, companies, their capabilities and their know-how, uh, as well as to collaborate externally with strategic partners. Okay, So that was early 2019 and then we all know what happened uh, towards the end uh, early this year, uh, COVID-19 uh, struck us. Okay, So while we were all um, cooped up at home, I started to reach out to my colleagues and, and, and say that uh, uh, since we, we, we have so much time to reflect, uh, uh, why don't we take this time to think about two questions? One is that in the short term, how do we address the issue of uh, infection control? How do we fight this pandemic? Two, the pandemic will change the world, right? So how do we ponder about how, how the world will be like after this? And how do we respond positively to that change? So we got ourselves uh, organized and uh, did some thinking. And so when the organizer came to us to approach me to share, the timing was right uh, for us to uh, to, to share some of the collective thoughts uh, that we have uh, uh, think through. So today I'll be um, taking us through these this, this two, two main parts. Uh. The first part would be this idea about the need for a new dimension to our urban resilience. Okay, so this new dimension is about the need for pandemic resilience. And then the second part is that if we want to embrace this idea of pandemic resilience, uh, what is the design approach we can adopt right, to, to realize it? Okay, so let's start with uh, health and resilience. Let's start with the definition uh, for the purpose of this study sharing. Okay, if we start with the WHO definition, health is a state of complete, complete uh, physical, mental, and social well-being, okay? And not merely the absence of disease of infirmity. Okay, so, so, so then, What's the next? The, the next question will be: What is well-being? Okay, so the next slide. If we go by the Global Wellness Institute, uh, the the um, the definition of uh, well-being is about the active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles that lead to a state of holistic health. There's a circular reference back to health, but I think the key words here is the ability to actively pers pursue activities, choices, and lifestyles. Okay, then next, what is resilience? So if you go by the English definition, um, there are two meanings here. The first one is the capacity to recover from difficulties. That means it's a sense of toughness. Okay, and then the second meaning is that it's about the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. Huh? So this is uh, a bit different. It's about elasticity. So two meanings. Okay, so if we look at urban resilience, uh, if you go by the United Nations Habitat's uh, definition, it is about the measurable ability of any urban system with, this, uh, with its uh, inhabitants to maintain continuity throughout all shocks and stresses. That means toughness. Huh? While positively adapting and transforming towards sustainability. Okay, elasticity. So, so while we may remain tough, right, we need to find ways to adapt and improve, uh, transform towards sustainability. Okay, so if we start to reflect back about what we have just gone through, we, we, we can sense there are two types of extreme responses. Uh, the first one uh, for, for cities or uh, countries that prioritize public health, you find that uh, the measures they put down, you know, you call it lockdown or circuit breaker or Doscon orange or, or red or whatever, right? It is to minimize human to human transmission okay, by reducing the physical contact. But through experience, we also know that it is not sustainable in terms of economy and social. People will get getting, crank, uh, getting nuts. Huh? And then there's the, the other extreme uh, responses that prioritize economy. Uh, it's very simple, right? 
lives get threat, threat, uh, because because if livelihood is important and people are frustrated, they, they want to open up, then there's risk to human lives. Okay, there's a risk, the great risk of pandemic um, situation getting spiraling out of control. So what we what what really do we need? We need a new normal, which is pandemic resilience, uh, which is tough and elastic. Uh, which is able to uh, achieve all the both both end you know is is a middle ground that's able able to achieve both public health and safety while sustaining economy the 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 social well well being and uh, and more importantly um, it must continue to su support the environmental uh, environmental sustainability because the climate change challenge is still there it does not appear or go away. Just because we have the pandemic, right? So, so some may ask, uh, why why is it important? Uh, why don't we just embrace this new? Uh, why do we need to embrace this new dimension of uh, pandemic resilience? Why don't we wait out? You know, why we wait for the COVID nineteen to blow over? Um, I, I fr frankly, I don't think people in this room are this naive. But uh, in case there are those of your friends <laughs> who think like that, let's go through this this. Go through the motion uh, to state the obvious. If, if we look at scenario one, the, the more pessimistic or more conservative uh, scenario, first of all, there's no guarantee that effective vaccine will be developed. Okay, today we know that there are many vaccines or many diseases do not have effective uh, vaccines like AIDS, dengue, chikungunya, malaria, and all that, right? So, this is a bit of a remote scenario, uh, but nonetheless, it, it if there's no harm for us to be prepared for it, okay. A more likely scenario is that uh, some form of vaccines will be developed. We, we look at the amount of uh, uh, investment into the research. Uh, some form of vaccines are likely to be available, but most of the even very um, optimistic projection is that is only going to be available for um, about eighteen months from now, which means that we have to find ways to live through these eighteen months, right? And the other thing about vaccine is this: any vaccines is rushed through and rushed the market. Is it safe? You know, there's uh, what are the possible side effects? Um, the 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 vaccine that Putin has announced, uh, many Russian doctors say that they, they will not try it. Okay, so then there's the next question of uh, production capacity. Even when uh, a vaccine has been uh, uh, gone through trials and go to the market, right? Uh, are they able to scale up the production? And then there's also uh, the other possibility of um, that these vaccines are only partially effective. That means it does not eradicate the, the, the virus, but it just keep it under control. Um, and the pandemic will evolve into waves of epidemic, right? That means it does not go away. It just come in as uh, waves of ups and downs. And uh, then the next question is that the, the COVID-19 may mutate, right? And then you have new strains, and then you need to have new vaccines. And then whatever it is, even all this can be addressed. I think there's a bigger question. What about the next virus? Something else, right? Next virus may, or we can we can even be, be certain about this, that will always emerge. So when that happens, what do we do? We we go back to the same, same, same uh same mode again, you know, or do we adopt a pandemic resilient new normal where we are um, where we are able to, despite whatever pandemic that comes our way, we are able to go about our lives uh, in healthy and sustainable ways, okay, and then as part of our urban resilience strategy, okay. So if that is the kind of outcome we are seeking, um, how is that? How is that like? How is this new normal like? How is it different from the old normal? So there are probably many factors. Huh? Today I would highlight two. Okay, the first one is about this thing called activity density. Okay, this is the first notion. The first notion I like to address is, is this question. Many people talk about density. So when we come to density, we 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 we, we can read many sensational headlines. Huh? Uh, you know, you can read it for for yourself. Huh? Understanding the pandemic is density to blame, you know, density in the pandemic era is density doom. So we read, we read many, many of these articles uh, on the internet. There are many of this. 
uh, I read through many of them. There are two main groups. Huh? Uh, one group is pro-density, arguing that density economize resources and facilitate the fight of pandemic. And, and I found that these people who argue for this, uh, this camp tend to be the subject matter experts. Huh? And then there, there, are, there, are, there are the other groups, uh, the more sensationalized uh, people, sensation, sensationalists. They tend to be the mainstream media. Uh. Maybe I think because fear sells better. <laughs> okay. But it doesn't matter which camp. Um, the point I want to make here is that if people disc want to discuss this issue of density, right? My, my question would first be to ask, density of what? Is it density of floor area or population? Or is it really about activity? Okay, so let me use an example to illustrate. We, we have two cases here, development A and development B. The first one has a floor area of 20,000 square meter uh, A, and then B has a floor area of 10,000 square meter. The floor ratio is uh, double, huh? A is double, floor ratio of four, let's say, and B is floor ratio of two. So which has a higher risk of contagion? Um, most people I ask, the first instinct is that since the development A is more intense, right, is, is higher density, this is their, their understanding of density. Logically, it should have a higher risk of contagion. Okay. Now, let's, let, me, let me give you more, more information. If the users in development A is 1,000, and user number in development B is also 1,000, and then suddenly the, the scenario change, you know, because the, the, the average area per user in development A is double is double that of development B. That means we have a better chance of spreading people out. So, so this example goes to show that density is really not about GFA, right? Okay, so some people uh, would say, okay, oh, re really, then, then it's the density about population, right? Okay, then we, let's look at this example. Development A and B. The area, floor area is exactly the same, and the users are exactly the same. So does it mean that the, the, the risk of contagion is equal between the two? So let me supply even more information. So if development A, the users are segregated and organized into smaller groups. They don't mingle, they don't, uh, they minimize the contact, huh? they, 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 and then they practice uh, uh, social distance and safe personal uh, hygiene and all that. And then in development B, users are mixed together and congregated, okay? So the population density is the same, but the risks are not the same, right? So it's also not simply about population density. It's really this thing about activity density. So it's, it's quite a new notion. We need to go beyond the conventional thinking about density, simply in terms of uh, floor area or population. We need to think about the intensity of uh, activity, right? So this is the first, first notion. And then uh, there's a second notion that we need to get used to. Um, is this distributed model. Distributed model of work, learn, and play, right? Again, let's go back to, uh, go to the examples, huh? and it's easier for us to, to understand it. Uh, in the old normal, people's habits and norms huh, was largely uh, to, to do things physically. Even though technology had always been available for uh, alternative ways, uh, but habit and culture are hard to change. Uh. So work was 100% physical. School was 100% physical. Uh, by physical, I mean that people physically travel from their homes to their workplace, to schools. And then when you want to go to shop, uh, uh, e even e-commerce e was available. That was like 10% of the uh, trading volume, uh, commercial volume. 90% of people were still doing it um, physically. Worship, right? People will go to church physically, right? So that was the old normal. 100% physical, almost 0% remote. Okay, of course it brings along a lot of the urban issues. Peak hours, right? This, this, this task were done within a narrow band of time. Uh, 9 to 5, right? 8 to 6. Narrow band of time, and then it leads to uh, urban issues, infrastructure issues like congestion, pollution, and then of course the, the latest that what, what we have learned is that it has contagion risk. Okay, and then suddenly when uh, circuit breaker came, we realized that it's possible to do it remotely. So we work from home, we learn from home, we buy from home, we even worship from home, right? Hundred percent remote, 
when the change is forced upon us, suddenly we realize that it, 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 actually it can be done. So, but that was not healthy. We know that people were getting upset, getting depressed. Uh, um, people wonder, you know, what happens to social life, okay? So, the new normal looks like this. It's a distributed model um, in which a balanced mix of both the physical and the virtual, re uh, virtual or remote nah, will become the norm, right? So, so in this diagram, you see two numbers, 50% uh, both sides. Uh, this is just hypothetical. It's just an indication of a contrast against the two earlier extremes. But the actual ratio will vary from organization to organization. Uh, some may find 30-70 works better. Uh, others may find 80-20 works better, right? But the, the key point is this. Uh, the, the key point is that if we adopt a distributed model, re resilience become built in. Imagine that uh, in, the, in the scenario, right, that the virus is never completely eradicated, but comes in waves. And as a society, we will have to be elastic. And during high alerts, we need to be like, for example, maybe 80% remote, 90% remote, 10% physical. And, and during times when the situation is under control, we may swing towards the other way, right? 20% remote and 80% physical. So the elasticity comes in. So once we are used to the distributed model, elasticity, elasticity become uh, built in. Okay, and this new normal uh, where we combine the best of both worlds uh, would, would support, uh, must aim to support better health and well-being, right? Okay, and in addition, right, if we pursue the distributed programming as part of our design thinking process, uh, I, I believe it will open up many new opportunities uh, to address not only infection control issues, but many other urban issues. Right. For example, infrastructure that becomes less crowded, new business models, uh, new forms of uh, social programming and services, um, more 27 kind of uh, lifestyles, uh, more 20, 24 7 kind of lifestyles, but less crowded, okay, um, and all that. Uh. So, how does it inform us uh, or how does it shape our design approach? Uh? I would start by arguing that in Singapore, our excellent in urban infrastructure has laid very good foundation. So this is our starting point. We are quite ready for this new normal. Uh, in, in particular, I'm, I'm referring to how our urban infrastructure uh, is able to support community health and wellness, okay? So let, let's, let's go back to this definition, okay? Well-being is about the active pursuit of activities, choices, and lifestyles, okay? That lead to a holistic uh, state of uh, health, including physical, social, and mental. Um, so according to one study, there are different factors that contrib contribute to our health and wellness. Um, and you can see in, in, this, in this breakdown, um, the quality of healthcare constitute 20%. Okay, it makes sense huh? because health and wellness is not only about absence of disease. The, the remaining 80% uh, comprise of uh, social economic factors uh, at the top. Huh? education, jobs, uh, family social support, income, community safety, and all that. 30% um, comes from individuals' health behaviors, okay, diet, exercise, uh, whether you abuse alcohol and tobacco, um, sex. Uh, and then 10% comes from physical environment. So the direct physical environment appears to be a small component, okay, but I would argue that the physical environment does contribute to the quality of all the other factors, including healthcare, right? For example, whether a clinic or a park or the schools are, are easily accessible from where you live, okay? And uh, through many reports, right, regarding uh, surveys conducted internationally, um, during circuit breaker or, or lockdown, um, having urban infrastructure and community facilities and social services within easy reach becomes even more important, okay? So you look at this diagram, if, if people um, are not allowed to travel or they choose not to travel during a, a circuit breaker period, right? Um, if within their homes, there's easy, easy access, right, to a range of uh, green and blue infrastructure or community facilities and uh, social amenities, okay? Their lifestyle becomes better supported. Uh, life is not as hard. Huh? Life becomes more livable. Okay? Um, and in your mind, right, looking at this diagram, you probably already see Singapore. Okay? 
uh, most of us here are from MND. So I think you are already very familiar with all these sites. Huh? Uh, the two diagrams on top are older towns like uh, Bishan. And then the diagrams below are newer towns like Pongo. Okay? We, we, we are actually fortunate that majority of our population lives in HDB heartlands. And the nature of HDB heartlands is designed such that they are, the, how, the homes are well served by a wide range of social amenities as well as the green and blue infrastructure. Okay? And then if you look at the upcoming developments, right, uh, on the top left-hand corner, you see the Pongo Digital Districts. On the right-hand side, you see Tengah. And uh, even you look at the industrial estate, uh, the, the, the up-and-coming industrial estate, uh, the Sungai Kaduk Eco District, the green and blue infrastructure and the diverse range of community amenities are built in. Okay, so all this has become our, our urban DNA. Okay, so the point is this, uh, is that imagine cities where they want to move towards a distributed model, but they realize that their communities are not even ready, right? Not, not conducive for work from home or ready to support uh, remote working. How, how do they even do that? They can't even start, right? So, so the, the point is that we, we are on a good, uh, good starting point. And, and, and during the circuit breaker, we also uh, did a study to, we want to validate this, uh, that, that Singapore is ready. So I, I, um, I got my colleague, Dr. Lee Jin Ting, to, to do a study. Um, the, the, the topic is about the recreational use uh, and perception of uh, public green spaces during circuit breaker. Uh, there are a couple of aims. Uh, uh, we wanted to know how green spaces uh, were contributing to people's uh, well-being during uh, work from home. Okay? And, and we, we, we confined the study to our staff, uh, CPG staff, because we primarily also want to find out how, how are they coping. Right? So before this study, there was an earlier study that uh, we found the majority are still coping okay. Uh, they, are, they, are, they are getting along fine. And uh, we wanted to know whether the green spaces, open spaces, um, are they uh, able to access them and, and does it contribute to their well-being? Okay. So um, it's, a, it's a small pool of uh, survey, uh, 200 people. Um, so, but because our staff are, are staying all over Singapore, so there's a sense of randomness. Uh, so we, we thought that the, the, the number, while it's small, uh, is still quite representative. So there were a few key findings. Uh, first of all, 60% agreed uh, that outdoor space played an important role in their work from home lifestyle. Okay, and uh, out of the survey, 54% uh, uh, agreed that outdoor space could serve as an alternative wellness hub during the pandemic. Uh, the number is not as high as we expected. Uh, we, we thought it could be higher, but nonetheless, it's still a validation. And then there's a second finding. The, the second finding is that we found that uh, while about 20% actually increased the use of outdoor space during the circuit breaker, uh, and then about 19% have no change, 61% have decreased the use of outdoor spaces. Why? So if, if, if they feel that the green spaces are important to support them, but how come there's a drop in usage? Okay, so, so we wanted to know why, and there were two findings. Huh? One is that environmental factor does play a part. Huh? And, and, and among the different environmental factors, the, the one that influences the change uh, in behavior the most is, is distance. The, the distance between the green open spaces and their home. Okay, so, so there's one question about, do we need to look uh, deeper, dig deeper into, uh, should we strengthen the access to our outdoor spaces? Okay, and then there's another finding. It is uh, more a, psychological or behavioral one, right? Um, I, I, I personally find that this one is maybe the influencing factor why people uh, use the green spaces less uh, because that, that includes me, okay? Um, respondents during circuit breaker were concerned about health. They were risk, uh, risk averse. Um, the, the survey was conducted in early July, okay? So the respondents were perhaps uh, still trying to avoid going into the community to minimize physical contact. Okay, so, so anyway, all these uh, questions uh, lead us to, to start to ask even more useful questions. Huh? For example, uh, this, this, this question or this finding will lead to the, the question of uh, whether are there ways where outdoor spaces could be designed to maximize fix, physical well-being and minimize transmission risk. Okay? So, so it, it leads us to other questions huh? like, for example, 
we came across a Singapore startup company uh, called Zero 2.5. Um, they had commercialized plant ionizers. They used plant to generate millions of ions, uh, negative ions. So it led us to think, can we intensify negative ions generated in our park? Uh, and does, so, does doing so provide measurable health benefits? Uh, for people who are familiar with negative ions, they, they have two main benefits. Uh, one is that, um, okay, the positive ion in the body uh, leads to irritation. So when, when the positive ion is built up in the body, people feel uh, irritated. Okay, and, and then when they are exposed to negative ion, it, it becomes neutralized. So that's one benefit. A, a greater benefit for the pandemic, perhaps, is about this uh, negative ions that they are a, a bit of, um, and they guys get attached to small particles uh, and that include virus. And when that happens, it removes them from the air. It, they get attached to surfaces, right? Then we can wipe down, we can clean it, you know. So this is something we, we're currently looking into. Uh, if there's anyone interested to, to, to work with us to, to go into this research, uh, please approach us. Uh, but okay, but this, this is just an example. Uh, I digressed, digressed a little bit. This is just an example to illustrate that we do have excellent urban infrastructure. Okay, our green and blue infrastructure, uh, social amenity structure to support our well-being. Okay, so this is the main point. So we come back to the distributed model. So on the left-hand side, if our communities okay, are well supported by good urban infrastructure, what is left to develop will be new social norms. Eh? Um, the ability to, to maintain safe distancing must become part of our daily habit. It must become a culture. Um, the ability for organizations, schools to adopt distributed programming must become part of a culture. Individuals must practice personal hygiene, right? And if all these things happen, the left part of the equation for the distributed model is complete, right? It's, it's about this thing called um, pandemic resilient communities. So left, this part is complete. Then it, it's left to the right-hand side of the equation, the public places, what do we do, okay? So I'm coming to the last part of my, uh, my presentation. Okay, it's this thing called pandemic resilient built environment for the public places. So life must go on, right? We, we cannot stay like this, uh, depressed and all that. Even if the pandemic continue to be with us, life must go, go on, okay? So um, what do we do? So it's really about managing activity density and supporting this distributed model of work, learn and play, right? So that, to, to us, this is actually quite simple, quite straightforward, you know. Uh, it, 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 is, it, is, it is really about creating safe bubbles uh, for every, each of every of these workplace, schools and ledgers. And there are ways to do it, uh, okay? It's, about, it's all about managing activity density within these boundaries, within these premises, okay? How, how do we do that? And actually, the, the know-how, the know-how to, know, to manage this activity density is already known. We, we have already lived through it for the last few months. Okay, the, the, I put up a, a, a model here. Um, the information is uh, extracted from various sources. Uh. Um, there's a US Center for Disease Control, uh, European sources, and then as well as uh, Ministry of Health from Singapore, Ministry of Manpower. But we put together a diagram to illustrate a COVID-19 hierarchy of controls. Okay, um, the, the most effective control is, is physical distancing. So work from home is the safest. If we are working from home, we are not exposed in the community, right? That's the safest. But this cannot be 100%, right? Because it's not healthy. It's safe, but it's not healthy. We, we do need to have team bonding. We need to, need to have, uh, uh, to, to meet our colleague for certain activities. We need to meet people, we need to meet our client. When you meet the client first time, we need to, to forge that, that bond, right? So when we go out to uh, public places, then we need to have the next level of control. Uh, so first of all, we have a level of spatial control. Um, we need new spacing norms. We may, we may um, need to put up physical barriers. Uh, we use routing design. We, we increase the ventilation, right? Natural ventilation. So, so there's a passive aspect of the spatial control. And then over, on t over and above that, we need to have active engineering control, right? Your ACMV strategies, the disinfection regime, 
uh, using smart solutions, like for example, um, even in parks, we, we start to use uh, robots, right? Robot dogs to, to do uh, robotic surveillance, things like that. So, so this one requires a bit more intervention, right? next level of control. And then after that, the next level will be administrative control, right? Um, visitation management, temperature management, uh, contact tracing apps, all these are administrative control. And then the last line of defense will be personal protection. So every individual must know how to protect themselves using protective uh, equipment, uh, they wear masks, they wear gloves and all that. Okay. So the methods are really known. The question is this, this all these have not become our design language. Okay. Um, they, they have not become integrated into our design thinking for, for most of the built environment professionals. Uh, okay, let, let, let me use a green, green design as an illustration and, and you, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, today, almost every architect is a green architect, right? Today, 2019, 2020. But environmental sustainability thinking was not natural, okay? Uh, back in 2005, when BCA first introduced Green Mark, uh, Developers didn't want to do it, okay? And architects need to hire uh, experts uh, to help them with green design, okay? So today is not the case anymore. E everyone actually embraced that thinking. It's already integral to their design thinking. But when you come to pandemic resilient thinking, uh, today we are like 2005 uh, for, for, for green design, you know, we are like that. So, so during circuit breaker, while, while uh, we were working from home, uh, CPG colleagues are uh, working from home, I got them together. Okay, uh, okay, <laughs> we're not, we not physically coming together, but we, we, we got together in spirit and in mind uh, okay, to develop a tool. So essentially is that we need to bring two body of knowledge together. Okay, so I, I, I use this diagram to illustrate. Uh, one body of knowledge relates to community infection control. So, so we had two groups of people who were able to contribute. Uh, the CPG healthcare team, uh, they built up their knowledge since the SARS period, SARS era, right? And then they, 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 were, con they were in the project team of uh, the National Center of Infection Disease. So they had a lot of knowledge, design knowledge. And then we have CPG FM who were managing COVID-19 isolation centers. So the knowledge about managing these isolation, isolation centers are, are very current. And then they also are uh, managing town councils that, that they have to observe a lot of safety uh, measures uh, during the COVID-19. And now on the other, the other part of the knowledge, right? Uh, body of knowledge is about the built environment, uh, architecture, engineering, how do we execute project? How do we manage costs? And how do we manage facilities? Um, so we need to bring these two body of knowledge together. And, and, and what we did was that we developed a framework, a pandemic resilient design framework that makes it become integral, make it easy for architects, engineers, uh, built environment professionals, facilities managers to integrate pandemic resilience thinking into their, their usual mode of thinking, their frame of thinking. Okay. Um, obviously, the, if you break down to the four pillars uh, of uh, the, the, the planning principles, materiality, uh, systems design, and then the operational considerations, uh, there, are, there are a lot of details like, which I will not be covering here. Uh, what, what, what's important is that uh, after this, this tool has been developed, uh, it, it makes it, it, makes it uh, practical for us to, 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 to think, to, to populate this, uh, this uh, knowledge, uh, this know-how to, to more of our design team. Okay? And we started applying it uh, to, to whether new projects or existing projects, we started to apply it. Okay, so, so a set of tools are, are become available. Um, anyone needs to want to find out more and uh, talk to us more, we, we are happy to, to, to engage you. Okay, so assuming that um, when all these public places become safe bubbles, okay, um, so the question, the next frontier would be this. Uh, if the community is safe and then the public places are safe, the last part of the, 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 the puzzle is to solve this one. It's about how do we bring people from their homes to the public places and back in pandemic resilient manner. Okay, so the last frontier will be on the transport system. How do we have a pandemic resilient mobility? Okay, and, and the fact that the moment we adopt a distributed model, the, the congestion or that is already reduced, right? Because we are not talking about 100% of people rush to one place during peak hours and after that rush back. 
right? It is it's reduced. Uh, may not be exactly 50%, but it's reduced. And then we can further decongest uh, uh, by looking at distributed programming. So we do not think about the distributed only spatially, but it's also across time. So instead of spreading activities between nine to five, traditionally, right? Can we look at, so there's an eight hour time band. Uh, can we look at 12 hour time band uh, between morning eight to evening uh, eight o'clock? 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Or can we spread it even more? Um, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. You know, that would be 16 hours ban. Okay, so so this this kind of thinking, uh, we, we are not there yet, but if we can start to adopt this kind of thinking, we believe that it will, it will spark a lot of innovation, okay, um, programming innovation. Um, and and we know before before COVID-19 hit us and seize our entire attention, the, the big things that we were talking about. Uh, is this thing about future economy and, and this this huge social economic transformation that, that is uh, coming upon us, right? Earlier I was uh, chit chatting with uh, Prof Heng and uh, we, we intellectually, we know that all these are coming, they will come and we need to change. But as, as creatures of habit, nah, change was hard. Nah. And then suddenly with COVID-19, change just came, you know, and, 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 and we have just moved out of our original comfort zone. So, so I personally see that the disruption brought by the COVID-19, it can be a catalyst for greater transformation. And, and my hope is that if we have to go through this pain and change, uh, can we, uh, and, and, and this change actually uh, help to um, accelerate the growth of digital skill sets and, and change of mindset, right? Um, does it actually also enable us okay, towards a new global? Globally, actually, you can apply the same concept. If Singapore is a safe bubble, and then we are now talking to other cities to create to to um, create these reciprocal uh, safe bubbles, and then if the the travel between the places are pandemic resilient, you know, can we actually use it as a as a way to uh, transform to transform the world? Okay, and and my hope is this now uh, is that if we go through this pain and change, right, can the new normal not be a compromised version of the old normal, but an opportunity to a new renaissance. Okay, so I, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, we, we want to contribute to this conversation and, um, and, and, and these are done during circuit breaker. I, I, I got our colleagues to come together and put up a website. So the, the, this website is already, already launched. You can see the QR code there on, on the screen. And, um, uh, it works on mobile devices also. So if you, if you take out your uh, mobile phone, you can actually snap it and then you can uh, give it a try. So the, the, the first landing page uh, is about the infection control design principles. So, so we put that up to share our knowledge. And uh, if you go to the, I think the second site will be ready soon. Uh, the link will be available within this first site. Okay, that uh, it is about pandemic resilience solutions uh, and information. Okay. Uh, we organize it into different uh, pillars of uh, knowledge, uh, uh, open spaces, smart state, and uh, FM, healthcare, education, so on and so forth. Okay, and then uh, obviously this is um, a work in progress. Uh, it will be always, always be growing. Uh, as we develop relevant information, uh, we'll post it. The, 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 the nature of this, this kind of future gazing web page, uh, uh, future gazing site is means that is it is a lot less definitive but a lot more exploratory okay uh but but we are happy to contribute okay so uh last but not least i would like to give credit to my colleagues and uh, these are the people who, who supported uh, the whole endeavor and uh, despite the need to hunker down uh, they were not down they were down but not out so so they truly embrace the spirit of resilience. Okay, so this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much.